decided to come to Calvary uh, when we found out that Brooke was pregnant with our little one, Calvin. Um, I grew up in the church and, and I wanted to have the same experience for him and I couldn't imagine not giving him that opportunity. When we decided to come to Calvary, um, it was a new experience for me. I wasn't really raised with a church, so it was important that my son was um, going to be raised going to church and everything because I think it's important. Um, I enjoyed coming here. When we first made the decision that we wanted to start going to church, uh, honestly, we just kind of picked the place and, and started going, and uh, we liked it a lot, and it was just a nice atmosphere. Everyone has been really kind to us, and uh, it's a really nice sense of community. I understand the message, and I just leave feeling refreshed every Sunday. I grew up in the ch with the church, and uh, it's part of my life. Um, I went to Sunday school all through high school, actually. Um, so I'd say that was the, the start. I don't think uh, that I really got to the point where I'm at until we started coming here. Um, I'd say the biggest change in my life is that I've been a lot more calm, a lot more reasoned and rational. I do read scripture from time to time. I think what I always end up coming back to is the Sermon on the Mount. And I kind of think about what Jesus tells you in terms of how to act. And I kind of look back to that to remember what it is I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to act. I'm always a person that worries a lot. I worry about everything. I worried the whole time I was pregnant. I worried about him. And um, when we came that Sunday, I decided to follow Jesus at that time. That was my first experience doing that. And I continue to learn more every time we come. And I definitely worry less. And um, when I do get worried or anxious, I can talk to God. And it's calming and refreshing knowing he hears me and understands me and knows my needs. I am Brooke. I'm Jordan. This is Calvin. We, we are, are the Hawkins. And we, we are made new. I love that video. Calvin was an evangelist before he was born. He brought daddy back to church and brought his mommy to church and to Christ, and we praise the Lord for that. This morning on Mother's Day, I want to uh, share a message with you entitled, A Mother's Longings, A Mother's Longings, and it's based on 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we'll be looking at the verses of uh, the uh, various passages there in 1 Samuel chapter 1 uh, throughout the message. The first thing that I want us to notice is longing for motherhood, longing for motherhood. As was already recognized in the opening reading, motherhood can hurt. And we don't want to rush into the service, we don't want to rush into a message without recognizing the fact that uh, motherhood can hurt for a variety of reasons. And we see that right here in this passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Elkanah, that, that was a man's name, Elka, Elkanah had two wives. And that wasn't real uncommon in the Old Testament. We have to remember this was in the ancient world, and, and uh, God never put his approval on it, but it took place. And God used people uh, that were in this situation, but it was never good. <laughs> it was never a blessing. Uh, every time it happened, it was a problem. Uh, it was a problem for Abraham and Sarah. Uh, it was a, a problem for Jacob and, and his wives. And it was a problem in King David's reign. It was a problem in King Solomon's time. And matter of fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't totally research this, but Solomon was about the last that we read of in Scripture who had more than one wife. He had thousands of wives, and maybe that's why it, it all ended. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a, not a good situation, but the Bible is real. It tells us what happens. Everything that's in the Bible, God's not putting his approval on, but uh, Elkanah had two wives, Pen Penina, Penina and Hannah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah could not have any children. And when they went up to the temple, Peninnah provoked Hannah. And this, this was always the problem. I mean, can, can you just kind of imagine with me what it would be like to have two wives and several children? 
in, in the 21st century, and you know, you're getting ready to go on a road trip, and the two wives are fighting over who gets to sit uh, shotgun next to the driver, and who has to sit in the back with the kids. And, uh, you know, one, one might say, well, you have to sit in the back with the kids because they're your children. And the other one might say, I want to sit in the front because he's my husband. And, uh, you know, you're going down the road, and the one says go faster, and the other one says you should go slower. And one says you need to be in the right lane because we're going to turn. The other one's telling you to get in the left lane. And, you know, just a, this co- constant thing. Uh, the, the mother of the children say, I, I can, can we please stop my my little one has to go to the bathroom, and the other lady says, oh, no, we, we, we can't stop. We've got to keep going. We're already going to be late. We just stopped a half hour ago. Uh, and, you know, just all of those kinds of things. And, and you'll see in Scripture that I'm not too far off from that. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it says, And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival, Penina was her rival, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. It was, it was an intentional thing on behalf of, of Peninnah toward Hannah. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? And so here we see a lady who is in a situation, Hannah, where she could not have children. And in the ancient Israel culture, uh, to to not be able to bear children as a woman was actually looked at as a curse from God. That uh, the the giving of children was a blessing, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, to not be able to bear children was looked upon as being a, a curse from God. And, and there are many women today who, who long to be mothers, but for whatever reason, they are not able. And we know with modern science that it's not always a- any problem with the mother. It may be because of, of the husband. It could be a physical problem. It could be other th- reasons. But there are many who, who are brokenhearted and long for motherhood and weep. And, and today, t- we want to say to you that we love you and, and that we weep with you. Perhaps you're here today and your mother passed away. And, and maybe that's still fresh. And maybe it didn't happen that long ago. And your heart is broken. And on this Mother's Day, instead of bringing celebration, it brings pain and sorrow. And, and we care for you and, and extend our sympathy to you. Perhaps your mother wasn't a good person. But when we talk about Mother's Day, there are some people to say there's nothing to celebrate. There, there's nothing to honor. My mother was abusive. My, my mother was cruel. My, my mother not only uh, physically beat me, but was, was abusive verbally toward me. Perhaps you're not speaking to your mother. Maybe something years ago happened, and you haven't talked to her for years, and she hasn't talked to you for years. Perhaps your own children have rejected you. Perhaps you would love to reach out to your children on this Mother's Day, but you're not looking for a phone call, you're not looking for a card, you're not looking for any kind of response because you didn't get any last year or the year before or the last 10 years. And we need to recognize that as the Church of Jesus Christ. On this Mother's Day, there are broken-hearted mothers. Mother's Day can hurt. Or perhaps you've lost a child. Maybe you began the season of expectancy with excitement and enthusiasm and that child you've never been able to give birth to or that child died right after birth. And we shed your tears with you this morning. The longing of motherhood. Penina could have children, but Hannah could have none. And it was a great burden. And in our world today, there are many that are in the same situation. The second thing that we notice is the longing for God's blessing. The longing for God's blessing. Just as I said, in in the culture at large, for a woman to 
not be able to bear children, it was not only her own grief and sorrow, but society around her looked at her and said, oh, she must have done something terrible because God won't bless her with children. And, and, and it became a, a, a very uh, obvious thing to people around them that, that somehow God has not blessed this woman. And so one time when they went up to the temple, Hannah poured out her heart in bitterness of soul and in weeping and prayer. And, and Hannah made a vow. She said to God, if, if God gives me a son, I will give him back to the Lord's service. And as she was praying there in the temple, Eli, who was the priest at the time, was sitting over on a chair near where she was praying, and her lips were moving, and she was passionate, but no words were coming out. She, she was just overcome with grief and was praying to God from her heart, and, and he could see that she was praying, or, or, or that, she was, that her lips were moving, but no words come out. And he assumed that she was drunk, because they had just had a time of eating and and, and so on, and thought that, uh, that she was drunk, and she explained that she had not been drinking and told him of her prayer and vow. And we need to remind, remind ourselves as the church of Jesus Christ, we're living in a culture that doesn't value children. But as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to re be reminded this morning that children are still a blessing. They're not a burden. And we need, to, we need to be able to say that, yes, the, we, we don't want to be always against the culture, but we have to stand up for some things. And, and just because we believe that children are a blessing doesn't mean we're against, we don't hate, we love. We love the children. What is wrong with the church of Jesus Christ saying we love children and they are a blessing from God? And that's, we need to be able to say that as the church of Jesus Christ. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 17 to 20, Eli, the priest, answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She, being Hannah, said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And so we see that, that this was a blessing, and, and that Hannah longed for, for this blessing from God, and she prayed from this blessing of, of God, and God fulfilled her prayers and answered her prayers. And as Christians, we must speak up about the value of human life. And I would encourage you this morning, right out here in the Connection Center, when you go through these double doors, Debbie will be out here, and she's representing CareNet. She's a member of our own congregation. She'll be right there, and uh, she's our representative. And uh, the baby bottles are there. Fill them up with whatever you would like to, uh, coins and, and cash, as, as Becky's already announced. Or you can just write a check and put in what you would want and bring it back on Father's Day. And uh, we're going to collect them. And if you take a bottle, bring them back. I, I found this out years ago. If you take a bottle and keep it, instead of helping the pregnancy center, we're hurting them. Because then they have to go out and buy new bottles. And so if you take a bottle and you can't fill it up, at least bring it back, okay, so that, that we, we haven't uh, lost those. But uh, we, we need to speak up about the value of life. And we need to be able to speak up about abortion, to, to encourage women, and this is why we support CareNet, to encourage women not to have abortions. There, there's other options that, that uh, can take place, and, and we need to speak for life. Again, it's not hate. We don't, we don't hate people who have abortions. We, we don't hate those things, but we do love babies, and we do love children. And, and there are those who abuse their children, and we need to speak up against abuse. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes even within the church, you hear of people who abuse their children. You should never abuse your children. And, and there's different uh, definitions of abuse, but certainly uh, we, we should never, never abuse 
our children. And abandonment. There are children who have been abandoned by their parents and sometimes just taken someplace and, and just left and, and abandoned or left at home alone and, and abandoned. These are things that as the church of Jesus Christ, we, we should stand up on behalf of the value of children, the value of life. They are a blessing from God. We don't live 600, 700, 800, 1,000 years before Christ. We live today, but God's values are still the same, and children are still a blessing, and life is still a blessing, and we need to be able to say that. Adoption is a better option if you absolutely cannot raise your child. There are several things that adoption does for everyone. First, it preserves your life of the child. It, it, rather than aborting the child, if you choose adoption, that child's life is saved. That child has an opportunity to live. You're putting value on the life of the child. It also provides a child for another couple or family. Perhaps there's someone who is longing, and we've had people and have people in our, in our own church that long to be able to adopt a child and, and are, are, have not been able or have to wait a long time. And, and when you realize and, and make the decision, I can't raise this child and give them the proper care that they need and the proper home that they need, then offer that child to someone in adoption so that they can have the opportunity uh, to adopt that child. And it also places your child in a caring environment. Uh, the adoption agencies are always careful to examine homes and to make sure that families take care of the children. Now, like any system, sometimes it falls through the crack and children still end up in bad homes, but the effort is made to provide for that child a good home where they are loved and cared for and have provision. And so the, we need to remember you know, we, we can be so influenced by what we see and hear around us that we almost become ashamed to say that children are a blessing or that life is sacred. But we need not be ashamed of that. It's the word of God. It's the truth of God. And we need to stand upon that. In Psalm 127, verse 3, it says, Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Again, in Old Testament uh, Hebrew poetry, when something is repeated, often something is changed and then repeated, so just said in a different way, that's to emphasize it. It's like it's been put in, in bold letters or, or italicized or exclamation points have been added. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him. And sometimes people joke about the low value of their children. But I want to say to you this morning, it's not funny. It's not funny. You know, your dad might have said that about you when you were a kid. It, you know, your grandpa might have said that generations ago. But that often, that was before society had turned as it has in the area of abortion and abuse and many of those other things. To say you'd give your child away for a quarter or that uh, you're dumb or stupid or, you know, you, you don't have any value. We wish you'd, we didn't. To make any of the, even if you're saying it in jest, it's just not funny. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we should not even let those kinds of things come across our lips. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 15, then the little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. You know, the disciples were with Jesus and every day these great crowds of people were coming and, and they were asking Jesus to heal them and, and to cast out demons and, and to take care of their family members. And, and, and the disciples were just overwhelmed all the time with these great crowds of people. And Jesus was the center of the focus. And when someone brought children to him, they said, oh no, Jesus doesn't have time for that. But Jesus said, no, bring the children to me. I have time for them. The others can wait. Bring them to me. And he said, the kingdom of God 
is made as such as, such as these. Children are not going to grow up someday and be important. They are important right now. They are, they are at the most important time of their lives. Surveys have shown that most people that choose to come to Christ come to Christ before the age of 14 years old or at the latest 18 years old. Now, there's always some that do, but the vast majority come to Christ either in their childhood or in their teen years. There's no greater time in their life than at that point. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we should be making every effort to bring every child we possibly can to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and at that age, they are moldable and shapeable. They, they are learning. And, and they learn values and, and, and uh, attitudes and beliefs that will shape their future. The church of Jesus Christ has a better opportunity and Christian homes and Christian families have a better opportunity of influencing children while they're small than what we will ever have influencing anyone in the whole world as they grow older. We need to be able to reach them while they are still pliable and teachable. And not only that, but children can draw others to Jesus. I remember Ed Keyes told me this. If you don't believe children are important, go to a soccer field on a Saturday. If the kids are on the field, the parents and the grandparents and maybe even aunts and uncles are on the sidelines. You can't even find a parking place. If, and the younger the kids, the fuller the parking lot. Okay? Let's take that same principle for the church of Jesus Christ. You know, these children, not only are they pliable and open to come to Christ, but they draw their families to Christ. Who could ever say to their grandchild, no, I'm not going to church with you, if your grandchild says, oh, grandma, grandpa, would you go to church to, with me? Of course you're not going to turn that down. Moms and dads aren't going to turn that down. You're, they're going to want to be where their children are. So not only do children come to tr Christ at that age, but they draw others to Christ. And they're still young enough to not realize that they're supposed to be afraid to witness. They're, they, they, they're bold. They're just right out with it. If they think it, they say it. And so if they came to know Jesus as their Savior, they just want everybody else in the world to do the same thing, and they bring others along with them. And then the longing for godly children. Elkanah and Hannah kept their vow and brought young Samuel to the temple to live and serve the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 25 to 28, when they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli and said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Can, can you imagine how hard that was for Hannah? She put up with years of Pen Penina or Penina mocking her, irritating her, trying to make a fool of her because she couldn't have children. When she walked out into the community, she felt ashamed because she knew everybody believed that God had withheld his blessing from her and that somehow she was cursed of God because she couldn't have children. And she wept and she prayed and she asked God for a child and God answered her prayer. But because she had made a vow, she kept her word. And when that child was weaned, they went back to the temple and she offered this child to Eli the priest for Samuel to be raised at the temple and to serve the Lord. I can't think of anything hardly that would be any more difficult than that. To to on your own accord and of your own will to take your, your child and hand them over, someone that you had prayed so much for. And early in a child's life, Christian parents should bring their baby to offer to God, the prom promising to raise the child with godly principles 
and to bring the child faithfully to the house of God and to seek God's blessing on the life of your child and to request the help of the church to nurture the child in spiritual things and model Christian values in the child, to bring that child. You, You see, the good thing is you don't have to leave them here. It's good for you and it's good for me that you don't have to leave them all here. But uh, you can take them along home with you, and you can raise them. But you have that responsibility to teach them and train them the things of God and to bring them to the house of God so that they can be with other children and that, that adults in the church can show the love of Christ and model what it means to, to be a Christian. It's a very important thing for Christian parents to do that. And I just want to insert something else right here. You know, your children are not your children. Your children belong to God. And sometimes we look at, and, and I'm, you know, I can be the same way with my grandchildren. Look at them, oh, they're growing up too fast. And when my sons were ready to get married, you know, the, 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 the tears, and even when they went to college, the, the separation that comes. But, you know, you only really have two jobs as a parent. One is to raise your children to become mature adults so that they can stand on their own and live the life that God intends them to. God never intended for your children to stay babies or preschoolers or elementary students or even high schoolers. He intended them to grow up and to be adults. And the second responsibility is that as adults, that they would be godly offspring, that they would be adults who serve the Lord. That's all that our responsibility really is is about. And so we bring our children like Hannah did to the temple, but we take them along home, but we promise to bring them back. We, bring, we promise to, to bring them to the house of the Lord. We promise to instill in them godly values and to help them not only to grow and mature as a human being, but to mature and grow as a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of Jesus Christ. The greatest responsibility of raising children is to raise them to serve Christ. Stormy Umartian wrote in her book, The Power of Praying for Your Adult Children, wrote this, You don't want to pass on to your children memories of a loveless, lifeless, powerless, passionless spirituality. You want to exhibit to them a loving, dynamic, powerful, passionate, exciting, hope-filled, compelling, living relationship with the Lord. You want your children to know the Lord as the almighty God for whom nothing is impossible. It's worth praying that God will reveal to you anything you and your children need to be set free from and then ask the Holy Spirit to overflow you all with his liberating presence. Not dead religion, but a vital personal, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Parents, how is your relationship with Jesus this morning? Would your children describe your relationship with Jesus as passionate, on fire, serving the Lord with a whole heart? Are you passionate for the Lord or are you lukewarm? Are you being faithful to the vows that you made when you stood before the Lord to dedicate or baptize your child? And have you led your children to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? There is nothing that is more exciting or more important than for a parent to be able to bring their own children to Jesus Christ. If you come to this church for one year, you probably ought to be able to memorize a prayer to lead someone to Christ. Because I say it every Sunday. To confess your sin, to repent and turn away from your sin, ask Jesus to forgive your sin, and and make a decision to follow him. And, And as a parent, in the privacy of your own home, to be able to get down on your knees with your child at bedtime, or whenever they may come to you with a question, and to be able to pray that prayer with them and lead them to Christ. It is the greatest privilege in the world. Yes, 
as a church, we want to reach as many children as we can. And we celebrate when in our classes or in our outreaches, someone comes to Jesus Christ. But don't depend on the pastor or children's workers or youth workers or someone in the church to lead your children to Jesus. You can do it. And it's a wonderful privilege. It's something that you and your child will never forget as long as you live and for all eternity to take that little child and to lead them to Jesus and to help them to follow him all the days of your life. Perhaps you're here today and you've never even asked Jesus to be your savior. You've never confessed your sin to him. You've never repented and turned away from your sin. Perhaps you're here today because you're honoring a mother or perhaps you're a mother and you came with someone today because it's Mother's Day but you've never taken the opportunity to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin, and I turn to you, and I'm choosing today to become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, I want to give you the opportunity to do that before we leave this morning. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you and for your love for us. You love us as no earthly father can. Lord, we thank you for motherhood and for the fact that you love us so much that you put us into a caring environment, that that you gave us someone that would love us and care for us. And in our humanity, we fail. There are some who don't even try. There are some who are intentionally mean. But that doesn't mean that motherhood isn't valuable. Motherhood is something to be honored because children are important because life is important, because we have the opportunity to lead our children to you. And so we honor mothers today. Lord, there may be some among us who've never confessed their sin, never come to the cross of Jesus and ask you to be their savior. And Lord, I would encourage them to pray in their own hearts right now, along with me in this prayer. Dear dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I've committed acts of sin just like every human being. But Lord, I come to you today recognizing that only you can save me. Only you can forgive my sin. And so I turn away from my sin and I turn to you and I ask you, dear Jesus, to forgive my sin. And help me to begin to follow you today. And Lord, I make a decision right now to follow you all the rest of my life. And I pray, dear Lord, your blessing on those who have prayed this prayer. And that they would be able to follow you as you would desire them to. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.